Defending the American healthcare system is like confidently pointing at a square-wheeled car, watching it stall and move slower than round-wheeled cars, and continuing to cheer it on. The solution is right there. You're delusional. You are a clown. Who here is familiar with the Be A Hero Fund? It's an advocacy group it was formed in large part to push for the betterment of American healthcare. It's been active for some time, raised millions of dollars, pushed uh, local representatives and national representatives for everything ranging from an improvement to our broken system to the outright full implementation of Medicare for All. And I'm very delighted to say, yes, they're good. And I'm delighted to say that they actually asked me to talk about Medicare for All, uh, which is something that I like. There's, if you type exclamation point M4A in chat, and I believe it works in YouTube chat as well, uh, it'll give you links to a Discord server they have where they encourage people to get involved in organization and activism, and also to uh, link to a text campaign that you can sign up for. Cold cells now, mind you, but allow me to make a case, would you? So I want to talk for a little while about Medicare for All, and I guess broadly American healthcare. Uh, and normally when I talk about stuff like this, I lead with data. And if you've watched my stream for any, any, any length of time, you know I've gone over the data on this. There was plenty of discourse back during the 2020 primaries, back when Bernie Sanders was a viable presidential candidate, and we talked about Medicare for All and how it was cool and good and how we like it, you know? Remember that? You remember those good old times? We've done that, and the data's out there. And while I'll talk about it broadly in a little bit, I thought... Uh, that I might entertain you at first with the most effective kind of argument. Some of you may know, but I wasn't exactly born poor. Uh, rumors of my uh, wealth and in infancy vary from me having been born in a uh, three-story mansion in Beverly Hills uh, to uh, what is actually the case, which was... Uh, me essentially having a middle class experience just with a really good school district and neighborhood, which, thank God. Uh, but one thing that I was not was poor. I was certainly not poor. Uh, and with that, what that meant was that I was able to get access to fairly decent healthcare when I needed it. I got glasses when I needed it. I was like six. I was really young when I got glasses. I was able to uh, get treatment for an actual early positive test that I got for tuberculosis. Kind of a weird thing to get, right? But yeah, I tested positive. Uh, the bump from the shots that they gave me afterwards lasted for like a year. I don't know why the bump for those shots, uh, they just, it's like a, a, like a raised indent in your skin for some time. I don't know. Anyway, I got over that because, you know, modern medicine. And that was great. I think I broke a toe bone once. And I got that taken care of. Uh, I actually got a third-degree sunburn once. That was a funny one. I am very white. I'm Polish-Irish, mostly. And I was out in the sun, and, you know, my parents, responsible parents, they say, put on sunscreen. I lied to them. They trusted me, and I lied to them. Uh, my back, it looked like a lobster. It was, I mean, it was bad. It was, if I ever die of skin cancer, it was specifically because of that one mistake that I made in childhood, which at the time was mostly an extremely painful and unfortunate experience, but now in retrospect, it's a little bit scary, and I worry about that. Uh, so I'm not happy about that. I actually distinctly remember one time I tripped down uh, the staircase uh, of my school, and one of the, this is disgusting, by the way, one of the gigantic water blisters that had formed on my upper shoulder ended up popping, and it was, and I shit you not, one of the most painful experiences that I've ever had in my life. But I was able to get the treatment that I needed. But even back when I was a kid, I did notice something. And it was that anything involving medical care was always a source of anxiety for my parents. Now, again, and I want to make this abundantly clear, I wasn't poor and I'm not trying to claim that experience, but my parents were never exactly enthusiastic about anything involving non-regular medical care. Uh, it always seemed to be a source of some anxiety for them. And I was so confused because I knew at the time I lived in Beverly Hills. I knew I had some relative assumption that I was well off, but somehow medical problems still cost them a lot. And part of that is because of my dad's job. He worked in the visual effects industry, which is non-unionized. 
And that means that benefits, uh, medical benefits were constantly shifting, all the time shifting. The job that he got here and there, uh, because healthcare is of course tied to your work. Here in the States, your job provides you your health care, or you can go out of that with extremely expensive, privately purchased health care, and wow, is that fun. Uh, but outside of that, it gets connected to your workplace. So if your job changes often, then it's really, really difficult to get a strong and consistent understanding of what you can and can't do. And even good medical care plans really don't cover a tremendous amount. Mental health care was something that I realized was largely out of the purview of medical uh, insurance outside like the, the very, very good stuff, you know? Of course, it often doesn't cover eye and dental, which I needed uh, eye treatment and my brother ended up needing dental treatment. And that was expensive stuff that my parents had to take care of on their own. And it, it sucked and I knew it cost them a lot because I always noticed that there was a sort of inverse relationship between any medical necessity between myself and my brother who were kids and got, you know, we got scrapes and what have you. And, um, and any other thing we wanted to do, vacations, parents getting a new car to replace an old junker, that kind of stuff. But I was a kid and I didn't really have any sense of perspective. I just thought healthcare is naturally like this, you know? It was always acceptable to me because my parents took care of it. Uh, then I went to college, first for an associate's degree in Santa Monica, and then later to Humboldt County in Northern California. Uh, and at the time I was still younger than 26, which thankfully, thanks to the ACA is the cutoff year. If you're younger than that, uh, you can still use your parents' health insurance. Meaning that while I was at university, I got to benefit from their health insurance, which is awesome. You know, 26, that's good. Kids are staying in their parents' houses longer and longer. So thank you, Obama. And I noticed something really odd up there. Even though I had the insurance. Now that I was expected to pay for stuff by myself, because I didn't want to bother my parents for more money, I worked up before moving up to Northern California so I would be able to use my own money. Uh, even though I was insured, getting proper health care was terrible. I mean, really, really horrible. In two directions. First of all, it was still expensive. The copays were still expensive. The range of available treatments was still expensive. Anything outside of regular checkups was still expensive. Pharmaceutical prescriptions were still expensive. And do not get me started on what a pain in the ass it was to realize that all the insurance in the world, unless you go out of your way for some really good stuff, does not help you much with anything psychiatric, okay? Maybe you get like prescription costs cut down and sometimes like visits less, but oh man, the broader process, I mean, it cuts in. Highly inaccessible. And I saved a good amount of money before heading up there too. My parents, they gave me some money when I headed up to college. So I had a, a, a little bit of a pool to pull from and it was still a lot. The other way in which I struggled was that healthcare was also physically inaccessible. In Northern California, in the small town in which I lived, there were very few doctors. Most students went to the local school, um, the like nurse uh, play, you know, the little like medical building they have on college campuses, wildly unequipped for many medical problems, which students would nonetheless go to because there was essentially nothing else to go to up there. You'd think that's only a problem that you'd have in a small town, but no, actually, people in big towns like Seattle still sometimes have to wait literal human months to book an appointment for something psychiatric or physical. Uh, because there are so few practitioners and so many people in need. I have had, even with my degree of relative privilege, so many negative experiences with healthcare. I've told this story before, but when I, when I wa worked as a security guard, there was a big security gate that I had to open and close. Uh, at the beginning of the store, it was 6 a.m. I had to open and close it. This was a big, heavy metal gate. Not those, like, wireframe ones, but, like, a thick... You could drive a car into that. It wouldn't have gone through. And uh, there was a spring catch that pulled the gate up the last few dozen feet because it was way taller than I was. My hand caught in the handle, and it broke my hand backwards. Like that. Palm just snapped clean backwards. And, uh, thankfully... Because that was an injury which took place on the job, I was able to benefit from workers' compensation, uh, which means that basically the job pays for the cost. And I had my broken hand. It was, you know, like the pointed yay, you know. 
And I talk to the manager and I say, this is a broken hand, you see? Is that why your left hand is kind of wonky? Still is, I'll get to that. And uh, the manager was like, all right, our workers comp station, what we have is set up with this place. And do you know where that motherfucker pointed me to? They pointed me to a tiny little workers comp specific uh, 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 doctor's office by the airport. I was in Santa Monica. LAX in midday traffic is not close. I had to drive to wherever I was going to go. One hand, not safe. So I said no. I said, actually, I'm going to go to the incredibly well-equipped UCLA hospital right there. And you're going to pay for it. And for some reason, it worked. I do not know how that worked. Somehow that worked. Real close to. And uh, I got phenomenal medical care. For that, I had got seen by 20 doctors. I, they gave me a good cast for my hand. It fit perfectly. And while they did cover the no doubt significant bill from that first visit for subsequent visits while my hand healed, I had to go to that workers' comp doctor's office down by LAX where they replaced my cast with a shit one. It, got, it went from a custom-made, hand-molded cast made by professionals working with computers to a generic just wire frame cast, half of which was covered in like a sort of bandage plate. And as a product of me using that bad cast for the rest of my hand's recovery, uh, my fingers no longer, I can't separate these two fingers, my middle and ring finger on my left hand. I can, I can when they're here, but like this, they always pull together like that. It's uncomfortable whenever I have to hold, say, like a, a bus pole, like a, like a, you, you know, like I have to hold something like this because these two fingers are always grinding against each other around the end and the other two. It's not comfortable. And uh, it's a permanent thing that'll be like that forever. I can only imagine how much worse it would have been if my very first treatment had been at that place. It's not just me either, you know. I mean, I've had plenty of friends and a lot of my friends uh, did not have the tremendous, the tremendous wisdom to be born to a well-off family. I have had plenty of poor friends, and every negative experience I have ever had with our medical system was monumentally worse for them. Every time I had to hear about their medical experiences, it was almost like a, a comedy, how bad it was. I can't, like, it's, it's like when a person in a comedy skit is telling a joke about how unfortunate some experience they had was, and every sentence, every adjective just compounds upon the previous in a almost showboating demonstration of what somebody must have crafted to have been an optimally unpleasant experience. You talk about the bills racking up and the inaccessibility and the changes in plans and the being fucked over by the bureaucracy. And I've had a lot of friends who have been in this position. Um, it, is, it is to the point now, and I mean this sincerely, and this is not, by the way, a, a positive reflection on my character, but sometimes now, like, I wince a little bit whenever anything healthcare related comes up in a group chat where I know that friends of mine who have had bad experiences come up because I know that I'm contrivance away from having one of the worst stories I've ever heard retold again. Like, not that there's anything wrong with them sharing it and God knows they've earned the right, but it is miserable, like being reminded of that. You know what I mean? So imagine experiencing it. None of what we've experienced here in this country, and I'm speaking from the perspective of an American, is innate or natural or in any way right. This country, per person, spends about twice as much as the average of comparable developed countries on medical care, and we have worse outcomes. We have like twice the average maternal mortality rate, well, childbirth mortality rate. Uh, we have a lower life expectancy. In almost every measurable medical sense, Americans do poorly relative to countries that spend less money. Now, I could cloud this conversation with a long and extensive description of the material incentives behind why things are the way they are, but I think I'd rather talk about what things are. What things are is fucked. In this country, and this is the subject of much memory online, Americans fear ambulances. This is incredible. We, d Americans, 
don't want ambulances called on them. If you ever watched Breaking Bad, it's the first episode where he passes out because of his cough. First episode, I'm not spoiling anything. And when he wakes up in the ambulance, you know, he's like, can you just set me off? And of course they can't. It costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, you know. Everything costs so much. And there's the insane dishonesty, too, with how people are charged. If you get charged by a hospital, uninsured, they will give you some exorbitant amount to pay. And if you ask them for an itemized list of expenses, often the price will go down. It will literally reduce when you ask for a receipt. That's not an uncommon thing. That happens. Often. Now, I don't know what kind of Kafka-esque economic rationalization is taking place behind the scenes there, but as I understand it, the reason prices in this country are so bad is because there's this bizarre incestuous relationship between medical providers and insurance companies. I don't like insurance as a principle because it seems kind of fucked by default to me. It's essentially gambling. Either you go your whole life spending thousands and thousands of dollars, renter's insurance, car insurance, health insurance, for no reason, because you never get sick, or uh, you end up getting hurt or in a car accident or your house catches on fire and you end up needing the insurance company to help you. Now, often when that happens, the insurance company will be an absolute bastard and do everything in their power to decline you coverage. Oftentimes, this was the case with pre-existing conditions, which is something that the ACA worked to address somewhat, where insurance companies would deny claims because it turns out that you coughed once when you were seven years old. The problem with this system is that it allows a two-tiered pricing uh, uh, structure, where if you are uninsured and you go to a hospital, you get charged, let's say, X amount. But if you have insurance, you pass it off to your insurance company, and the insurance says, hey, hospital, what if I just paid Y amount, bro? What if, I, what if I paid less than what you were charging the individual? And the hospital says, yeah, we were overcharging them anyway. And the insurance company pays less, and that's how insurance companies stay profitable. Somehow, despite you paying hundreds of dollars a month, but some hospital visits costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's because they don't pay what you would have paid. You see? Why you get those joke receipts where it's like, you got one Band-Aid, that's $200 on your receipt. This is all real, by the way, in America. You can look for an itemized thing. It's like, here's an IV drip, $400. Here, you got a, an, an aspirin, $50. This is real. The insurance company would not have paid that much if it had gone to them. So with all that being said, there are real problems with our system that are made evident in obvious and empirical ways. Uh, and people have tried to fix it for a long, long time. One way of fixing it is through a public option. This is something that Biden talked about uh, during the presidential race, and it is something which, and I want to be clear about this, would be an improvement to our current system. A public option is essentially the idea that the government has its own insurance company. It's, it's, an insur it's a widely accessible insurance option that people can take if they want. So if you want to, you can get health insurance from your job, or you can buy it privately. And maybe the private health insurance you get is really, really good and expensive if you're very wealthy or whatever. But there's also the baseline insurance option provided by the United States government. And almost everyone can get on it with some caveats. I think Biden's plan would have gotten 97% of Americans. Now, this is a better system for a number of reasons. I want to be clear about that. That is so much better. And that's also, by the way, the system that's used like in all these other developed countries, okay? You go to these other developed European countries, you go to Russia, you go to Canada, whatever. That's basically how it is. You have the government option and you have the private options. And while countries vary in the relative prominence of those options, generally speaking, that is like the most common element of what is called socialized healthcare. And the nice thing about that is that uh, when you use this system, which is objectively superior to what we have now, as long as it's appropriately managed, even if it's inappropriately managed, it's still better than what we have now. No, it's not public option, public healthcare are different. Hold on. Public healthcare, the 
public ownership and running of the medical facilities is not necessarily the same thing as a public option, but I think public option is still considered a part of socialized health care because it still falls within the government taking care of some element of the broader process. Uh, so with regards to the public option, it would be accessible to most people, and it would essentially mean you get like a decent default, relatively low cost, low reward health insurance option for most Americans. Now that is great, okay? And I wanna tell you why. It's not great just because so many Americans are uninsured and un underinsured. It's great because there are civilizational benefits to good, quality, accessible healthcare that so many people completely disregard. Let me talk to you about that a little bit. See, a public option would cost tax dollars. After all, if the government was operating as an insurance company, they'd have to pay out to the hospitals. If you were insured by the public option, you'd go there and it would get billed to the government. So that's more money that we need to tax. But would you spend more money? Because an inordinate amount of money in America with regards to healthcare expenditures goes towards the infinite abyss that is the largely uncontested and destructive relationship between uh, private insurance companies and healthcare providers. That's why our healthcare costs twice as much per person as the average developed country, many of which have public options. Like, I think there's studies on this are done. Like, I swear to God, studies are done like this in every five days. I just subterraciously typed this. Look at this. This is ridiculous. Healthcare costs per capita by country. Americans spend almost twice, as mu uh, twice the average of 10 other wealthy countries, according to the Commonwealth Fund. So here we have New Zealand, Australia, France, the United Kingdom, Canada, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, Switzerland. And then with the worst outcomes and by far the highest bills, the good old US of A. Just Right in the top, right up there, you know? Anyone who's defending this system, I, I mean, it's, it's beyond defense. This isn't just an ideological thing. Like this is, this is an objectively, defending the American healthcare system is like confidently pointing at a square wheeled car, watching it stall and move slower than round wheeled cars and continuing to cheer it on. Like the solution is right there. You're delusional. I mean, you are, you are a, you are a clown. This is, this is Clown Town. This is a square car from Clown Town, and you were defending it as part of some sort of excellent comedic bit, which I do not find funny, by the way, given the circumstances. This is a serious matter. There would be tremendous economic benefits to a public option. I'll give you an example. Preventative care. See, one of the reasons why Americans spend so much uh, at the doctor's office or hospital or wherever else is because we are poor and desperate, and as a product of that, we do not go to the doctor to take a look at things which might, if treated early, lead to the reduction of a future, much more serious problem. There are many medical conditions which exacerbate and grow with time, which can be treated easily when young and not so when later. A quick question to all of you. What do you think would have happened to me if my parents didn't send me to the doctor's office as a child often enough for the positive tuberculosis diagnosis to come back. Do you think it would have been any easier to treat that if we'd sat on that for a few months? Probably not. Preventative care. For a lot of things. My vision was bad, so I got glasses, which saved me quite a bit of time and trouble in a lot of ways. It meant that my grades went up because I could see the whiteboard at the back of class then, actually finish the math questions rather than just wonder how other people could even do it from there, you know? Uh, it means that I tripped and falled less often, and that actually can lead to medical problems, believe it or not. Proper eyesight is a component of good health. It means that I was able... Did I say falled? Fell. Ha! <laughs> it means that... I was able to get my hand healed immediately by UCLA medical professionals rather than by some dog shit, low cost rent workers comp doctor's office by the airport. And for that reason, I now have a better left hand. It's very possible that my left hand would be in a much more claw or lobster like state without that. So thankful that's not the case. But not everyone is so lucky. I have friends who have 
spinal issues. I have friends who have chronic pain issues. I have friends who have severe, uh, I don't know what you would call it. Um, I'm not a doctor. Internal problems, which are largely a product of them not being able to be treated when they were younger. If everyone had access to medical care and the freedom to attend uh, and use that medical care when needed, there would be fewer severe cases in the future. You understand the validity of this, yes? From bone problems to cancer to blurry vision, which might actually be a severe eye condition, to headaches that might actually be brain cancer or bone spurs or or, or ankle problems or anything else. Even I fall prey to this. You know how I had an ankle issue a couple of months ago? I got tendonitis in both of my ankles because I ran on a treadmill with sandals. My fault. But when that took place, I didn't have health care. Um, also my fault, mind you. I can afford it. Uh, but because of that, this is my laziness, by the way. I'm not blaming the medical healthcare system for this one. This is on me. But because of all that, I didn't go to the doctor for some time. Now I have nerve damage in my back left ankle. Right in my back left ankle. It's like a dull, numbing pain that persists for 24 hours of the day for months now and probably will until I die. Uh, my fault, but the reason I delayed in seeing a doctor isn't really important because a poor person wouldn't have had to have been stupid like me to have been cursed with nerve damage. They might have just not been able to afford treatment. You see? The point here is that preventative care is incredibly important. What is it? An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure? Something like that. Yes. Poverty would have forced another person to make, through circumstance, what was to me a mistake. Preventative care goes a long way towards reducing overall health care costs. But it's not just that. There are also broader economic solutions to this. You see, sickness and uh, 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 health inequality, they both contribute to economic harm. How much economic damage do you think is done through sickness and medical mistreatment and ill health caused by the problems with our healthcare system. I've seen studies done on this. Uh, it seems to be fairly significant. I don't care to Google them right now. It's a fair amount. Uh, I'll say that much. You can Google. It's pointed point out. You could just Google. It's it's a large number. It's a it's a good amount. Um, society is more effective when people are uh, productive, uh, and people are more productive when they're healthy. Uh, so that also contributes to potential tax inflow that would compensate for the costs of a public option. In essence, would you have to pay a little bit more in taxes? Yes, you would. Would you save a lot of money, both immediately and broadly through society, uh, by allowing a public option to lift the poor to a, uh, to a higher state, um, to bring up our average life expectancy, to reduce our uh, infant mortality and our uh, childbirth mortality? Yes, it absolutely would. It would significantly reduce our healthcare costs. And anyone, by the way, who does not support um, the implementation of, at the very least, a public option, as far as I'm concerned, is pro-death. There's another argument to be made, by the way, about stress. Stress kills. Uh, that's not actually an exaggeration. Um, the hormones that our bodies secrete when we are severely stressed, as the poor often are, literally kills us. It's like... I, I know I say literally a lot, but I'm not speaking from hyperbole here at all. It causes illness. It causes death. And people are stressed when they are sick and cannot afford health care. Yeah, there are a ton of problems that are inextricably linked to stress. My wealth has done so much to uplift me in terms of my general ability to feel well. See, before, back when I was a kid, a little kid, my family was middle class. I am no longer middle class. You know what that means now? That means now I get to afford any medical care that I want. It means that I can afford psychiatric care, like the Adderall that I've been using over the past five days that has led to a significant increase in my mood and productivity. It means that I had access to a physical therapist 
And over the course of only a few months, I went from not being able to lift even light weights off the ground to being so healthy that my physical therapist said that I don't really have much of a medical reason to continue attending physical therapy. That feels good. This should not be exceptional. This should not be just something I get to experience. The physical comfort that I experience now as a product of appropriate medical care is a birthright that all of you share. That some of us may enjoy it and others not is a moral travesty and a crime. But it is your birthright, and it is something that we should fight for. Now, obviously, there is a sliding scale here. The more you invest in the quality of a public option, the more you'll have to pay in taxes. Eventually, uh, it no longer becomes a cost-saving measure, and you have the ability to spend more money for radically better health care. Where exactly on that spectrum a society should stop is, to me, largely inconsequential. We should continue to improve things in the obvious and empirical ways we can, for as long as we can, until those questions become relevant. Now, here's a problem with the public option. There are two main problems that I have with the public option, two reasons why I am actually a proponent of Medicare for All. First and foremost, I'll take, I mean, I'll take any improvement that I can get, by the way. There's a reason why I prefer one to the other. The first is universality. Uh, with regards to the public option, it is provided as an alternative to private health care options. Uh, this means that, invariably, the wealthier people in society are probably going to stick with their private health care and private health insurance. If you make like a million dollars a year, you're probably going to be able to privately afford health care that will be better than what a public option can give you. And what that means is the people who have the real power in our society won't have their foot in the same pool as the rest of us. Does that make sense? There's an element of sort of, we're all on the same boat to a universal, truly universal and singular healthcare plan uh, that I find appealing, um, in large part because much in the same way that Congress is so eager to consistently raise their own pay, I have a feeling that if they were all using the exact same healthcare as the rest of us, they might be a little bit more inclined, um, a little bit, a little bit more inclined uh, to um, to uh, <laughs> act positively. But there is another and more substantive reason. Okay, and the other more substantive reason is because, unfortunately, the way a public option would work in practice is probably that other private insurance companies would raise the bar for what types of people they would accept, the wealthier and the healthier, meaning that the public insurance, the public option, would largely be used by people who cost the most of insurance companies. Or to use that a little more explicitly, imagine that you have a public option which takes everyone, basically everyone, and then you have private insurance options. Now, the public option has to take everyone. Private insurance doesn't. Why would private insurance take people with pre-existing conditions, or people who are poor, or people with, say, very dangerous jobs? Maybe they wouldn't. I mean, why would they? That's a losing gamble for them, right? They want the healthiest people and the wealthiest people, because those people are the most likely to give them a good return. So, by way of exclusion, all of the poor and the sick, they're the ones who get pushed off into the public option. And guys, what does that make the public option? I am looking for one word. Oh, wait, that's okay expensive. That's right. And you know what happens then? Private insurance company X only spends $4,000 per member, but the public option spends $11,000 per member. Is government bloat destroying our economy? Uh, because all of the low return patients are being shunted off onto the public option, it is proportionally costing the taxpayer more which means that it reflects poorly on the effectiveness of that system. That makes it easier to cut. That makes it easier to fight against. And every year it's going to be the same thing. You're going to hear more and more studies come out about the relative ineffectiveness of the public option, which is, by the way, not because of the public option being bad. It's just because they are being forced to accept all the people who are the most expensive. This has happened before. This is a real problem. And this is currently happening to the ANHS. And this is one of the reasons why. I am hesitant about a public option. It is better than what we have now, but it seems to me like it's a band-aid solution. 
Because guys, what's the real problem with healthcare right now? Like, really, what's the real problem? Insurance companies. The entire system, the idea that insurance is at all involved in healthcare is, is the death knell. And it's all over the world, too. It's a highly profitable industry, okay? But the existence of insurance turns the entire game of insuring people into a gambling system where people who are already healthy and wealthy are already preferred, whereas reality has already selected them for fortune, given the fact that they are literally healthier and wealthier, that their relationship with healthcare providers is insular and mutually beneficial at the expense of patients who attend their facilities. Insurance companies are a problem. Medicare for all eliminates insurance companies. Medicare for all, or single-payer healthcare, is just that. Single payer. There is one option, and it is the government option. Now, if I were to talk about the potential political consequences of implementing something like this, I would be here for hours and hours, and that is not my intention. Yes, single-payer single payer healthcare would be difficult to implement. And yes, by the way, despite what some people on the left will tell you, Bernie Sanders' single-payer healthcare plan is radical by the standards of any country on earth. There are some people who say, oh, that's just like what they have in Germany. No, it's not. No, it's not. No. Bernie Sanders' healthcare plan is it's quite radical anywhere. It's, it was extensive and radical anywhere. And hey, I like radicalism. But it does play somewhat uh, against political favoritism at times. You see this with the polling, you know? You ask Americans, do you want Medicare for all? And they say, yes. Overwhelmingly. Republican and Democrat, yes. Do we want Medicare for all? Yes. And then you say, that means you can't keep private insurance. Also, taxes will go up. And they go, well. Hmm. Hmm. Well. I think it speaks a little bit to how bad the situation is that even Republicans, who are 24-7 sold narratives on how our healthcare private insurance system works, largely want some kind of um, socialized health care. Like, even if they're not necessarily sold in the particulars of Medicare for all, everybody wants better health care in this country. Everyone does. Everyone everywhere does in this country. Everyone. Do you ask, can we make health care better? Like, everyone agrees with this, you know? There are few true blue defenders of the status quo. So the real question is, how do we sell this to people? And how effective is it really? There have been many studies done on Medicare for all. Many of them, as I understand it, have shown that nationwide implementation of Medicare for All would actually still cost less than our current system. It would cost more than a public option, but less than our current system. You know why? Because even if we have to pay more in taxes, a lot more in taxes, don't delude yourselves, a lot more, the average savings of not having to pay any other medical expenses, health care, uh, pharmaceutical costs, anything, would balance out favorably for many Americans, not to mention the savings for businesses. Because right now in our current system, businesses pay for the medical uh, uh, insurance of their employees. So they would no longer have to do that either. And it would make things a little easier for businesses because they would no longer have to take care of that burden. And individuals would no longer have to pay anything relating to health care. And this is one of the sinister things. People see the cost of their taxes when you know the when the they send it off to the IRS but people don't really reflect on how much money they spend on medical stuff they don't really consider it often and the fact of the matter is it really really ramps up and it ramps up massively the older you get so oftentimes people who are young or like middle age will think this tax increase is greater than the what i would save by not paying for medical expenses but they don't think about themselves in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years and that's why it's an insurance game it's difficult to make a risk assessment of your own health. I am, according to my blood work, pretty healthy, despite the nerve damage on my left ankle uh, and being fat Ian and all. According to my medical, you know, litany, I am a fairly healthy guy. I don't know what's going to happen to me in the future. I don't know if I'll be injured. I don't know if I'm going to get sick of something. I don't know when my goddamn stage four terminal skin cancer is going to come in. I don't know. Uh, but I do know that I don't know. And that means that I want to live in a society where even if I have to pay more into the collective trust, I no longer have to worry about a medical incident in the future bankrupting me. 
medical insurance leads to medical bankruptcy in the long run. The system we have right now leads to an inordinate number of Americans being crippled by overwhelming hospital debt from hospitalization due to injury, cancer, uh, childbirth. How much does childbirth cost in the States? I've seen it go up in the five digits. What is it? I, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen bills for childbirth. Yeah, get up to like 20 or 30K sometimes. Childbirth. I mean, this is something that is civilizationally necessary. This is, li you literally, it's, it's, it's childbirth. You have to do, you have to do it. It's, we, we need to do it. And somehow, some people just get charged like the median income of an average American. Just for that. I think childbirth should be free. It's a radical opinion of mine. Anyway, in the long run, I think it would be worthwhile. And that's the reason why I'm proud to be speaking, not on behalf of, but to be speaking friendly with the uh, Be a Hero Fund, which again, if you type exclamation point Medicare for all, uh, M4A, not Medicare for all, that'd be a long command link. Uh, you can see links to uh, a Discord server uh, where you can get involved in organizing for the improvement of this healthcare system and also a text campaign. I know what you're thinking right now. Is this impractical? Pushing for this right now? Getting a big federal Medicare for all push when we don't even have a public option? What are the odds of that? And to be honest with you, you're right. That is one hell of an uphill battle, which is one of the reasons why I'm happy to announce that we live in a, uh, a, a country that's broken into 50 states if you didn't know that, and a few uh, incorporated territories and also some unincorporated territories. Um, actually, a recent survey indicates 64% of Republican participants strongly oppose M4A, but 4 in 10 are in support of a public option. Q Proton, it depends on the language of the survey, which I think speaks to people's general desire for better health care, but a sort of politically motivated unwillingness to explore certain types of better health care. Because there are some polls that you can find where it's like, oh my God, every American wants literally Bernie Sanders healthcare. And then there are other ones which are very explicit about all the costs involved that are more conservative. Um, I only, the, the only point that I wish to make is that while framing is indeed everything, there is a general desire for better healthcare and that the details are really a matter of how well you can sell it politically. So what I was trying to say is that we live in a society, a society with states. See, even if a federal push for better health care is uh, an uphill battle, there has been a uh, tremendous effort to get better health care implemented on a state level. Colorado Governor Jared Polis on Wednesday signed into law a public health care option, making it the third state in the U.S. to approve the creation of a government-run health insurance plan to be sold alongside commercial coverage on the ACA's insurance marketplace. That's pretty nice. One of the nice things about having a, a, a state, a, a society broken into states, is that contentious or difficult political subjects can be tested, field tested, in more progressive states before nationwide implementation. See, weed legalization, which will be federally legal soon at the rate things are going, or um, gay marriage. Gay marriage was legalized state by state by state, and then... We get it federally in 2015. And maybe this is something we can normalize on a statewide level too, which is the reason why, while I am an advocate for Medicare for All, I am not a sole advocate for Medicare for All. You might say that I'm in favor of a multi-payer approach to single-payer health care and some others, whatever you can get done, um, which is why um, the particular approach of the Be a Hero Fund appeals to me uh, because they seem to have that pragmatic and um, and sort of reasoned policy-based approach towards this. Uh, if I may, moment. Uh, so my experience with people who push for Medicare for All right now online is very negative. It seems like a lot of people on the left have kind of abandoned that fight and left it to people like Jimmy Dore, you know? Like, the only people who actively push for Medicare for all right now are like virtue signalers who do so to like further their podcasts, knowing that their efforts will lead to absolutely nothing. They just do it because it's because it's 
a good branding for them, you know? Some of the people who push for it even uh, pledge support to Democratic primary candidates who abandon their support for Medicare for All in favor of political viability. But there are good faith actors pushing for Medicare for All and for other types of superior health care. So I would encourage you to get involved in that. And I would encourage you as well to look into some of the viable state-level uh, health insurance plans that are being proposed right now. For example, I know that sometime in the near future, I believe it's called CaliCare, a California-specific push for statewide Medicare for All. Uh, I have seen the plans. There's a whole back-end budgetary math nightmare describing everything. It seems like a pragmatic and well-reasoned approach. California is a prosperous state, uh, saddled with what is no doubt a significant amount of excess healthcare-related medical costs. The pragmatic implementation of these policies will be a difficult uphill battle. Some systems will be better than others, but it is something to which you are all entitled. It is something which we must all push for. And I sincerely hope that you guys do. Do not let online advocacy for Medicare for All and other forms of improved health care be controlled entirely by bad faith actors or by people who are so mind clouded with idealism that they legitimately do not understand how to push for the pragmatic elements of their preferred policy. These are large and complicated problems to the weight of trillions of dollars. They can feel inaccessible from an individual perspective. And that's because, and I'm not going to lie to you, they mostly are. Uh, in your day-to-day, -day, the impact of your advocacy is probably not going to reach the totality of the scope of the problem at hand. But you are not alone uh, because you are, if you're an American, sharing a country with hundreds of millions of other people who are, let me be clear about this, very, very open to arguments about the problems with our healthcare system. Very open. It is uphill policy-wise, but ideologically, the people are on our side. The people want better healthcare. The people, despite what they may have been told, are not fervent champions for the private health insurance industry. They are not agents working to preserve a broken system. They are poor and sick and disillusioned with the current system. This is the richest country on earth. This is the richest country in the history of the planet in terms of the total economic output of this country. We are uh, unprecedented historically throughout the world, which means throughout the solar system, which means to our knowledge throughout all of the discovered known universe. Uh, we are, as Americans, special, not in that we're better than other people, not in that our country is intrinsically or inherently morally superior to others. We are special in that we have so much goddamn economic productivity to take advantage of, and we just don't do it. We just don't. We do not take advantage of the resources we have access to. It gets bled off through bureaucratic inefficiency, through systems that circularly reward the investment of people who I don't care for, uh, private health insurance stockholders, when we could be doing so much more. And people know this. So talk to the people around you, okay? And participate in organizing events when you can. Consider it an opportunity for socialization. Do you have any idea how many people in my community have sent me emails or donations saying, wow, I took your advice to volunteer and I met some really cool people because you're all always online. I know, you're, you're all internet people, you know, me too. But then you go ahead and do something and you make friends and you feel good about what you're doing. If you're doing that, you may at times be disappointed with what seems to be a lack of immediate gratification. The world doesn't change fast enough for you. That's just how activism is. I am very sorry. It's always been that way, and it's that way for like every cause worth fighting for. Any broad national push for anything is always going to feel this way. Okay? So 
try to think of it not so much as there's a gigantic ocean-sized pool of water that you're filling up one bucket full of a time, okay? Try to think of it as make activism or advocacy or volunteering maybe a small part of your life. The way that a brisk jog outside once or twice uh, a week might be a small step towards better physical health, a little bit of participation in advocacy can be a small step towards better political health and mental health and social health, by the way. You know, you can meet some fine people and, I don't know, talk to them about how cool you guys all are for supporting Bernie Sanders in the primaries. I believe in you guys, okay? I, I have the most ardent imaginable faith in your ability to make well of your time on this earth. If you're interested in learning more or learning more about the specific organization that reached out to me, uh, which, since people will probably accuse me of this, did not pay me, um, a, you can go to beaaherofund.com with their snazzy orange-tinted opening logo, uh, and you can learn, I assume, what a hero is, since that's the question being posed here. It'd be a little irresponsible of them to not clarify after asking that. That's just bad design, you know. And you can learn. So go look into that, and uh, while the times are indeed tough, never lose hope that a better world is possible. Never lose hope that uh, it, the system that we live uh, within is temporal and impermanent.